in our Bibles this morning in the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament. It's part of uh, the prophets, the major prophets. Um, in a chapter that many of us, we love. If you grew up in Pentecostal churches or charismatic churches, you're going you're gonna to be like, before I even read it, you're going to be hooping and hollering and doing that whole thing, jumping up and down, and spinning around. It's going to be Ezekiel 37. Much of us know it as the dry bones, the dry bones chapter. So let's turn our Bibles there if you can. We'll also have it up on the screen. Yeah, they're going across the street. Children's Church? Oh. Yeah. They're going across the street. Last week, we had them over in our, built, in our room right over here. So if you have kids, they left. They went across the street, just in case you guys need to know that. So Ezekiel 37 this morning. Again, we're talking on a series about speaking life, framing our world. And um, I'm also going to be going to a scripture after I read verses 1 through 14 of chapter 37. Just really quickly picking up one of our main, one of our main scriptures in this series, which is Proverbs 18, 21. And so let's just read this together, shall we? It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the spirit of and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. You know what? I, just, just out of my, just, just kind of just out of a top of my head. Someone should make a song about this, right? I bet they would make a lot of money. Just something, just, I don't know, just, it was a joke. <laughs> this is what I deal with on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm just, why not? Just... <laughs> Number four, or first four again. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also, he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath and breathe on the, these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breathe, breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. I need to do something before I need to apologize to my wife. I'm sorry for saying that to you and making a joke. No, like I, I do. Thank you. I need to do that. You know, there's, the, there's seven divine words that every, every believer, every person needs to know. I was, I've been studying a lot through these and someone had this. There are seven divine words that every person needs to know. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? So will you forgive me? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's, let's turn to uh, the Proverbs if you have it in your Bibles real quick. Proverbs 18 and verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Let me read it one more time. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Thank you so much for allowing your presence, your manifest presence to be here in a time of worship that we can come together in unity, Lord, to sing about you and to just be encouraged as we see other believers in Christ pursuing you, Lord. So we thank you 
We thank you for um, your word that you've given to us, and I pray that you would anoint me to be able to speak it clearly and concisely and to be able to truly be words from you, Lord, inspired by you to be able to be written on our hearts. So I thank you, God. Take everything that's me and and take it away, Lord, so that it would be purely you speaking this morning to all of us because we need you to speak into our lives, God. We have major issues that we're facing day in and day out, and we need you to speak. So we ask, God, that you would speak to us this morning. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to start out asking a simple question this morning is, is, is how are you hearing this morning? How are you hearing? Not necessarily, you know, I have really good hearing or I have selective hearing. It's not about that. It's not, what did you say? It's not, not really, you know, about that. But a, maybe a better way of, of saying it is, what are you listening to? What, what's, what's being spoken in that, that you are listening to in your life? For me, I, when I drive, when I get in vehicles and drive, I'm one of those guys that love to listen to music. Anybody else like that? <clears throat> I like to listen to music. And so it's kind of my nature to be able to, as soon as I get into a car, especially if it's my own, as soon as I get into the car, you know, be, before you, know, you even put it in reverse or in drive, it's, okay, let's find a station or let's turn it on. Let's make sure there's music playing on. And um, there's, it's, very, it's very rare that I don't listen to music in the car. And it usually has to do with when we have a full carload of kids and we're driving somewhere. And instead of really listening to the noise the, or the, the music, the music has become the background noise. And it's like, I have a volume knob, so at least I can turn down the volume of the radio because someone who should be very smart and should be able to be a, an instant billionaire has not created a knob to turn down the volume of their kids, right? I mean, if someone was able to create that, that would be amazing. I, I tried to do something similar. My wife said that was inhumane, and, but I tried to get those, those shocking dog collars, right? But it was like instantly no. I mean, there's no conversation, right? Anyways, but I was thinking actually about getting a limo and being able to have that privacy glass, but then I was talking and I was like, you know what? That would look really weird for a pastor to drive around Toppenish in a limo. It just wouldn't look right. People would start to talk, especially in a small town, right? So, you know, there goes those ideas. So if you guys have anything else, we're all ears to listen. But like I said, I like to listen to music. And, and it's, it's very rare and very infrequent that I don't listen to music on the radio. And, and usually there was something that I used to do. There's kind of not really a pet peeve. And I don't even know if it was really kosher. But it was something that I used to do. And it was, it, it was when I was getting into a vehicle of another person. And when I would drive with them, they would be driving their car and we'd be going and, and you know, I'm not going to turn the, their own radio, but I would wait for them to turn on the radio. And, and as soon as, as they turn on the radio, I felt, you know, this is my open chance to do this. And so what I used to do, I don't really do it too much because it's just our vehicles that I go driving, uh, driving around in. But, but when they, when they turn the radio on and I would go and hit the preset stations. Anybody know what like preset stations are your radio? I mean, there's FM one, FM two, AM. So I would go and then just like, boom, boom, boom. I mean, cause when you check someone's preset station, you really know who that person is, right? And it's a great way to really start off a conversation because sometimes it gets awkward in cars, right? When you're driving two people. I mean, I used to have to drive with my last job. We'd have to drive all over the place. So music is really kind of like a, a way to really kind of break the ice, so to speak. And so, you know, I mean, it was, it was weird. You'd be like, you hit the thing, you hit the station and be like, Oh, you like country. Hmm, that's cool. Or some, some one time I was driving with Tyler. He picked me up over here and we're driving his work truck. I hit the preset button. And it was rap. I was like, wow, I would have never guessed you for rap music. Right? I was like, man, that, just joking. That's, that's not the truth. But anyways, <laughs> But that is something that, you know, I used to do, and, and it's weird, right? I mean, it's kind of, hey, don't touch my stuff, but, but that's what I used to like to do. And, and it, there was, it was a couple months ago when I got into my, my Subaru, which is, which is amazing. Usually when we bought the car, I was like, babe, this car is small. I'm not going to fit into it. But when, with weather like this, I'm loving that Subaru. I don't care how smashed of a sardine I am, but we're driving all over. But it was a couple months ago, and I, it was around 10-ish. And I was going to the gym. I was going to go to the gym. And so I got in the car, started off. And, and you know, I'm, I'm just doing my routine. There's, there's, there's noise, you know, coming in the radio. And all of a sudden, I'm on my way to the gym. And I'm listening to talking. 
And there's just been a lot of talking. Sometimes on radio, on music stations, you know, there's, 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 there's talking, but then there's songs. And I was like, I'm not hearing any music. So I start to listen to actually what they're saying. And this is by no means a, a, a sermon on this. This is just something that happened. All of a sudden, I'm hearing these people discussing how, how people that, uh, talking about the gay and lesbian agenda. And that how they're, um, you know, mistreated in all these, in, in military, in workforce, and all these different areas. And I'm thinking, this is not K-Love. This is not Positive Life Radio. This is not my preset stations that I'm listening to. What is going on? So I'm like, what is this? And so I hit my preset number one, and it stayed there. I'm thinking, whoa, 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 whoa. Just a little background. My wife, I'm, I'm a mu- I like to listen to music. My wife likes to, likes to listen to news, Okay. And it was on NPR. And so in the morning, in the, in, in the morning, <laughs> this, I'm like just trying, not trying to cut. I mean, okay, shh, we're still praying. She's from California. She's from San Francisco. So, you know, we're all coming into the glory and glory and holiness of God. So it's step by step, amen. So I'm like, what is this? And, and she likes, because we all know that no matter what radio station or talk show is to, Everything is biased, and they all want you. And my wife is very wise, and she wants to hear from both sides, you know, both sides. But it had passed the, the news radio, and it got into a talk show when I got in, you know. So it was something different than what she was actually listening to. And I was just like, man, NPR, are you serious? At least put that on, on FM channels, too, you know, on the station, too, way back. Because it's like, that's something you need to hide. But I was like, so I had to like reset my, reset my stations, preset number one and number two to Christian, and then, you know, like 107.3 for three, you know, you, get, you just got to keep it real, right? You just still, you know, I want to be relatable with people. Anyways, but you know, but, <laughs> but anyways, I want, the, the reason why I asked you that question is I want to know what are your preset stations that are set to in your heart and in your mind? And when someone comes into your life and starts pressing those buttons, what are you listening to? What is being broadcast when all of a sudden someone starts messing with your life? And it doesn't have to be someone. It could be an issue of life. It could be a circumstance that all of a sudden you go to. It could be something financially, emotionally, relationally, educationally, whatever the case may be. All of a sudden there's a stress that starts to come on and all of a sudden our buttons start to get pushed. What is the recording that's going on in the back of our heads? What is being spoken in our hearts and in our minds that is causing us to actually move forward in life? And I know I used to love, you know, when I lived here, it was Cats, 94.5, and, and all these other radio stations. But it's funny, it's like, okay, I really need to start walking with the Lord. Let me listen to Christian radio and Christian and more Christian tapes and Christian CDs. And it's like, you know what, I, I just want to listen, just see what, what's new out there. And you go back to listen to secular music and secular stations, and what has happens? It's playing the old stuff that you listen, used to listen to a decade ago, right? It's just the same music over and over again, and that's sometimes how we have our lives. We're trying to do so much good. We're trying to walk forward in what God has for us. And it's just like, we're kind of tempted to go back in life. Well, let me just check this out and see. And it's just the same old junk that we used to listen to over and over and over again. But I want to know what is really speaking. How are you hearing? What's being spoken into your life that you're listening to and that you're hearing this morning? What is the preset stations? Is, is, it, is, it, is it stations that are speaking life? Or is it stations that are speaking death, speaking chaos, speaking destruction into our lives that are going down into our heart, right? Remember what we spoke last week? Jesus was saying in Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is the abundance that's going on in your heart? Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. What is being spoken out of your words? Because we're eating what we're saying, and it's continually going down in our hearts. So how really are we speaking? Are we speaking life into the atmosphere, or are we speaking death? Are we speaking our past over a situation, or are we speaking what God's word says? And that's the premise of this whole sermon this morning, is being able to have God's perspective and to be able to have God's word implanted in our hearts so that we can speak life and speak healing into the atmosphere and into our lives around us. Ezekiel 37, in the text that we read, it, it's this Jesus, or God brings him in the spirit into this great valley. And he's walking amongst these bones. Those of us that grew up listening to this text know that, that it's almost the text that is similar to the prodigal son. 
or the parable of the lost son, that it's been a text that has been spoken so much. And we can have preconceived ideas, and we love this text because it's so full, and it just brings our imagination to life, right? When we read through this text, it's like, man, I can, I can almost see the bones all over the place, and it's weird, and it's just gruesome. And we can almost place ourselves there. But what we see taking place is, is, is Ezekiel, just a little bit of background. Ezekiel is in captivity in Babylon. Okay, he's a contemporary with Daniel, which is a book after him. And what was taking place is that the, the southern, the lower kingdom of Judah was actually so disobedient to God, continually being disobedient to God, that he allowed captivity and exile to take place and take them away to a far off land in Babylon. And that's where we actually see Ezekiel. He's actually a prophet that's in exile with the people of Israel in Babylon. Okay? And so one thing we need to know is that God is with us. Even if we feel like we're in captivity, we feel like we're in exile, we, God is with us no matter what. And that his hand is upon us. That God's hand is always with us no matter what's going on. And knowing that, that God is allowing punishment to take place over the people of Israel because of their disobedience. And I know for many people that we can be so focused on God's punishment and God's judgment. But what happens in the end of every prophetic book? The prophet comes, he starts to speak judgment, he starts to speak doom. Do, but halfway through, what all of a sudden changed? His message starts to change and start to speak hope, starts to bre speak redemption, starts to speak restoration, starts to speak revival. And we need to know that and understand that, that God brings about punishment, but it's about bringing punishment to kill off the old ways and the old self so that he can be able to bring us into a newness and a new life that he has for each and every one of us. It's the same reason for us as we punish punish our children. If we punish our children in love, we're punishing them not because we just want to beat the heck out of them. It's because we love them so much that we don't want them to continue on in that habit that they're going over, over and over with, and that we have to punish them so that they won't be eventually brought into destruction and death to themselves and those around them. That is what, that's why we punish our children or train up our children in the way that they should go. And that is what God, because he's a good father and he's a loving father. And if we continually be our disobedient to him, he's going to allow punishment to take place so that it would be able to bring away that decay and death that is taking place in our lives from different habits, addictions, mindsets, whatever it might be. And so that is one thing we need to see and understand with every prophetic book. That God does speak judgment. He does speak punishment, but it's with purpose. Because he loves us so much, he doesn't want to leave us in that mess. He doesn't want to leave us in that junk, in that chaos. But he wants to take us to a new level. He wants to take us to a new place to bring us to that original intent for which he had for us. Amen? And that's what we brought out from that word framed in Hebrews chapter 11, 3, last work. It means to mend. It means to repair. It's the same word that, that meant when the, uh, when the disciples were washing their nets after Jesus came to them and they caught no fish. And they, it says they, that they were mending their nets. That word framed is the same Greek word there. And it means to mend, to repair. And, and it's to bring back or it's, it's to, um, anybody remember it? It's to bring back to what it ought to be. So it's to bring back to the original intent for which something was created for. And that is what God is trying to do in our lives. Sometimes there is punishment. Sometimes there is stuff that takes place. But it's to actually bring us to a place of the original intent for which he created us for in the first place. So we need to see that first and foremost. It's just like pruning a tree that it causes new growth to take place. So the current situation, it, it's bad for the people of Israel, and they were in captivity because of disobedience away from their homeland. They were a people that were lost in a different culture, and they were losing their identity quick. They no longer saw themselves because all of a sudden they weren't in the holy city, and they didn't have the temple in their midst. All of a sudden they were losing their identity. And what we see here taking place is that they started speaking certain things over themselves. Okay? We need to watch what we say. Watch our words. So they're in captivity. And here, in verse 11 of Ezekiel 37, it says, it's after the prophecy that, that God was, was speaking and was showing and revealing to Ezekiel 
All of a sudden here, God speaks. It says, then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry. Our hope is lost and we ourselves are cut off. The reason for this vision is because God was showing him the spiritual implications of what the natural words they were speaking over their life. They were saying this over themselves, over their families, over their very state of Israel, the people of Israel. They were speaking death and chaos and destruction over themselves. And this, and God brings Ezekiel into a place, into the spiritual realm to see, you know what, this is what they're saying in the natural. Well, this is what's taking place in the spiritual. This is really what's taking place in their lives. This is what they look like in the spiritual. And it's because of the words that they were speaking over themselves, the curses that they were placing upon themselves. And we need to know that God, that the words that we speak, they have the, 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 the power of life and they have the power of death. So how are our words this morning? What are the words that we're saying over our lives, over our marriage, over our resources, over, over our careers, whatever it may be, what are the words that we are saying? What do the words say about our heart? The abundance that's taking place in our heart. Is there greed or bitterness? Doubt or shame? Unbelief? Really not having faith in God, but just going through the routine? This is something that just took place in there as I was studying, and I, and I, many of you guys know I've been going through some issues, and hopefully I can and see someone, but, but I'm still believing for healing, but my leg was hurting, and all of a sudden I reach in, got my Advil, and I, as I was like unscrewing the bottle, Lord, please heal me, and I'm just like unscrewing the bottle of my Advil, and then put the two tablets down, is that really faith? Because we want to be able to not have the pain before. We don't take the Advil, right? We want to be, okay, heal me, Lord. And just, if it doesn't happen, then I'll, I'll go back. But is that truly faith? Or is it truly walking forward and believing, not being able to fall back on anything? Because that's what faith is. It's walking forward, not being able to have a safety net below us. It's believing and trusting in God. Believing what he said and what he has spoken. Do we have faith in what God has spoken into our lives? Do we have faith in what God has spoken in this scripture? <clears throat> Another thing before we continue on that we need to see just about the, just about the atmosphere and the areas is that the location where the bones were, and it says it was in an open valley, it was in a great valley. And in the Bible, we need to know and understand that when the Bible talks of valleys, for the most part, for many times, it's actually talking about places where battles took place. Okay, when, when Joshua was overtaking the promised land, when he was uh, going and conquesting the land of the promised land, many of the battles took place in the valley. Even in the, the old time of the old, old people in, the, in Genesis, battles took place in the valleys. We know that, that Goliath, David and Goliath, that battle took place in a valley. The last battle that's spoken of in Revelation, it happens in the valley called Megiddo or Armageddon. So we need to understand that this just isn't a place, an area with bones, but it's a place that a great battle took place, okay? It's where battles are fought and won, are in the valley. And we need to understand that many of our lives are lived in the valley. Not necessarily the Yakima Valley, but we live, our lives are lived in the valley. And when we are living in the valley, that there is constant battles taking place in our lives and in spiritual realms, and it's that point that we need to truly be conscious of the words that we are speaking. What are we really speaking over our lives when we are in the valley state, when we are going through the thick of it and knowing that there is junk taking place in my lives and it can't all be, you know, just, just happenstance or it can't just all be by chance. We know that there's some spirit behind it. What are the words that, are we, that we are speaking? Because that is the key, I believe, to bringing victory in a spiritual battle. And it can be a key to winning and losing a battle. When we find ourselves in battle is when our mouth needs to be equipped to speak life. Joshua 1, 7 through 8, it says, Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. 
Verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. God is speaking to Joshua before they begin to enter the promised land. And he's saying, do you want to be prosperous? Do you want to be victorious? Do you want to have a good, successful entry of the promised land? What does he tell Joshua to do? Watch your mouth. Joshua 1.8 says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Don't stop speaking them. Don't stop meditating on them. Don't stop muttering. That's, the, that's actually the word that, it, that is meant. It's a muttering. It's meditating. It's regurgitating the word that is spoken forth, that has been given to you by God through Moses. What are our words? What are we saying? What's, what's being spoken under our breath? Is it little daggers when our spouse leaves the room? When we put our kids to bed and you and your spouse sit on the couch, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe. It. What is being muttered? Or your boss leaves the office and there goes some daggers. There goes some death being spoken into the atmosphere at work. If you want to be successful, if you want to be prosperous, if you want to be victorious, what are the words that you're speaking? It's not an end result up here. I'll tell you, I was, I was with Ellie. I saw her uh, a couple of days ago when it was snowing, so I helped her dig her car out. And I was telling her something that I already had failed. She was like, oh, it's a good sermon. You know, I love this sermon. And she was talking how she was on Facebook. And she's like, I, it just, I just, after hearing your message, I went on Facebook and I saw these people, what people are actually saying on Facebook. It's just crazy. You know, and you really don't think about it until you actually, someone brings it up, right? But I told her, I was like, you know, I'd already failed. And it wasn't like 24 hours later. It was Sunday night after speaking the intro to how you watch your words. It was that night. We were laying up, laying up on uh, Bill. If you guys don't know, upstairs in our room is our girls' room. We have this big, one of those big eight-foot bears. And so it's our custom and tradition. That's where we have prayer time. You know, I mean, we all fit on him. He's just huge, ginormous. I even fit on him. And it's one of those things, you know, you just try and, you try and help your kids think that God is so big, you know, and he loves you so much. So it's like we all just lay and, and lay on this big Bill and we pray. I mean, we weren't even done with prayer. I, I'm usually the one that closed out. We weren't even done with prayer. And I was like, man, this leg is ruining my life because I've been going through so much pain. And he's like, hey, watch what you're saying. I was like, yes, yes, Lord. But as we could, get, we could say these things, and it wasn't even 24 hours and I was already, I mean, I just, I just if you guys weren't here, I preached, the, I preached the pain off the walls. But it was good. It was really good. I mean, <laughs> those are the people that were here are laughing. Anyways, just joking. But anyways, no, we can go through our, our different life and just all of a sudden things come out. But it takes time, just like, just like transforming our mind. It takes time to really watch what we're saying and really the life or the death that's being spoken out of our mouth. Amen? But how are we speaking? What are the words that are coming out of our mouth? But before we can speak and see, because this is a prophetic book and we're, we're following after a prophet and seeing how to prophesy and speak life and speak healing and speak restoration. But before we can speak and see God's word become a reality, we first need to hear and believe what he said. We first need to have faith in what he has said. So speaking God's word begins with hearing God's word. And our first response should be to hear what God has to say. And that is gaining God's perspective. Are we gaining a kingdom perspective really on our life and what God's word says? Are we allowing it to really impact our heart and impact our mind? Are we allowing his word of life to be really regurgitated into us so that we can believe it before we can actually speak it out? Amen. Ezekiel 37, one through three says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out into the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. And it's interesting, um, usually when I study, and hopefully when you guys read your word, and read, the, I know you guys probably have your own translations or versions that you like to hear, but I was going through a couple different ones, and in the NIV, it actually 
it actually says he took me back and forth across the bones. And we know this wasn't, so you got to understand, this wasn't some 30 second little jot. Like, oh, wow, look, at there's a lot of bones here. This, he took him throughout the whole valley, this open valley. And just silence in the midst of all this death and depravity, just silence. And all of a sudden, God has a question. Son of man, can these bones live? I know for many of us, it's like, no, right? No, these bones can't live. Some of us here this morning may be struggling with this very question. Can these bones live? Can my marriage live? My child who is too far gone, can they really be saved? Am I really able, going to be able to get out of debt and be able to purchase a house or be able to have some type of money? Or am I always going to be struggling? Is this habit or is this addiction going to be the end of me? Is my life really worth living? Can these bones live? One thing you need to understand is they weren't just bones and it doesn't even say they were dry bones, but it says that they were very dry bones that there was no life left in them. There was no hope in them at all. They had passed the decaying stage. There was no marrow in them at all, but it was already beginning to fossilize. Sometimes the areas of our lives and marriages and relationship with loved ones, a brother or sister, that, that all of a sudden something took place and there is no more resemblance of love any longer. These bones had no resemblance of life left in them. Is there areas in your life where there is no resemblance of life or resemblance of love or resemblance of hope? Because that is where the Holy Spirit is wanting to take you past this morning. Because he wants to speak life. He wants to speak hope. He wants to speak restoration into those areas of your life where maybe we have already answered that question and continue to answer it every morning. No way. Nope. There is no way that we're going to be able to get past this area in our marriage. There's no way that my child is going to be able to quit this addiction. There is no way that this habit that I'm facing is going to be able to get gotten rid of out of my life. There is no way that God is really going to be able to bless me to where I can provide for my family. But what is the thing that we see taking place with Ezekiel? Ezekiel 37.3 says, and he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, oh Lord God, you know. So what do we see taking place with Ezekiel? He's giving God room to speak. And I want to ask you this morning, are you giving God room to speak into your life? Into the issues and the circumstances that you are facing? Because Ezekiel gives, room, gives God room to speak. And when you give God room to speak, you're giving God room to be able to create a miracle. Are you allowing God's word to speak into your life? Are you allowing yourself to be able to hear and regurgitate the word of God so that it's not just trying to quote something, it's not just trying to memorize something, but it's something that is taking place that is transforming the way you think and no longer you're looking at a world perspective or from a worldview, but your mind is in heavenly places and you're able to see with God's perspective because God's perspective of us is that we're already into a final state and it's already spoken forth what we are. And that is the original intent for which he created each and every one of us. And that is the viewpoint that God has for each and every one of you. But too often we're seeing ourselves as the world sees us. Or as our spouse is saying over us. Or as we see ourselves in the mirror. And it's dead. And it's disgusting. And it's chaotic. But what does God's word say about us? That he has a future and that he has a hope for us. Amen. He has that for each and every one of you. So has your perspective, has your perspective been able to be changed by hearing God's word? Or when someone says something, does it go back to that preset station and go back to that junk of way of thinking and way of life? Are we allowing the world and what it has to say about us, which only brings medication. It only brings a covering and a masking of the pain. That's the only thing that the world can bring into life. God's word and his power 
brings true healing and brings true restoration where you don't have to rely on Advil. Where you don't have to rely on certain medication. TV shows that continually go trying to get the newest show or the newest movie or trying to do something to just stop the chaos that's going on internally, trying to mask the pain with whatever it might be. Are you giving God room to speak into your life? Because if you allow God room to speak, you'll be able to see him perform a miracle in your life. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Are you speaking forth God's word in an area? Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we continually hear by the word of God, it will continue to build up faith and believing in what his, his word says. And we'll be able to continue to walk forward in what he has for us because we have a level of faith being restored into our lives. Amen? So it begins with hearing. Speaking God's word begins with hearing God's word. So first it's perspective. Next, it's prophesying. Prophesy to the bones. Ezekiel 37, 4 says, Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Prophesying can easily be translated preaching. It's speaking under the inspiration of God. It's speaking forth his word into a circumstance or over a matter, over a situation. It's being able to be, be, able to be used as a vessel to speak forth his word into a situation. Having his word, having his mind, having his heart, and being able to speak it forth. Paul writes in the first letter of, of uh, his first letter to the church of Corinth, Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 3, it says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. He speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men, or to mankind. That word edification comes from the Greek, and it really means to build up a house. Are we using our words to build each other up, to build them up as a structure? Or is it being used to tear them down and to tear them apart? Are we building people up around us? Are we building our children? Are we building our spouse? Are we building the people even in our, our work? Are we building them up? That was one thing, just Kadri, just, and I'm not saying, you know, I'm all that, but when you watch what you say, it just begins to change the atmosphere. And, and I remember when I was beginning to, to uh, quit at my last job and, and be able to take over here as the lead pastor one of the guys, which I love, and he's very animated, and uh, he uses the F word like every other word. And uh, I mean, there's something only God can, can give you a heart for people. It just, it's just awesome. But he, but he was, he was all, it, was, it was a maintenance setting. So a bunch of, you know, a bunch of guys, a maintenance guys. And if you guys work with people like that, you just know. It's like, it's a different breed. <clears throat> anyways, and I was one of them. But anyways, it was like the last week or two weeks before I was going to leave. He's like, what are we going to do, man? You're the only one that like brings us back together as a team. <laughs> like, I don't know, man, good luck. But I would be able to speak life and just be able to separate people because, you know, there's a bunch of hotheads and you just be able to like, dude, come on, man. And just give them a different perspective and, and be able to speak Bible into them without them even knowing that it's Bible. That was the funnest part. Man, that's really good. It's like, yeah, I know it's good. And you're just like, on your way, you kind of laugh. It's like, he thinks I meant, I, I came up with that, you know? But are we using those times at our jobs or in our families or even with lost loved ones, being able to, to speak the Bible and just speak into the atmosphere and to create life instead of to continue on down the road of death? Building people up. Exhortation is in a sense of, of strengthening someone. It's encouraging them by coming alongside them and cheering them on. Are we encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we encouraging one another? Are we cheering them on? Are we rooting them on? Or are we kind of just sitting back like, man, watch this, man. They're just going to fall. Ooh, ooh. Did you see that? Oh, yeah. Hey, man, we're praying for you. Bless you. Or are we really coming alongside them 
and cheering them on, being their cheerleaders. We don't have to put on the, the, the outfit. We don't want to see that. But are we really cheering each other on, encouraging one another? The next is comforting. This, this is interesting. It is coming into contact, not only with the person, but also with the area of struggle and pain. It's being able to have empathy for the people or the area in your own life. It's being able to, to place yourself in their position. It's not sympathy, but it's empathy. It's being able to feel how they feel and sense how they sense. It's being able to see and feel what they are going through and still have the ability to speak God's word into their life and over the area. Are we comforting people? Are we coming into contact with other people? Not just on a Sunday morning, but is there true contact taking place to where you have placed yourself in their area and in their pain and in their chaos and still being able to hold it together and have the word of the Lord to speak into the atmosphere? That is prophesying. That is being able to speak words of love and words of healing and words of redemption into their life. Love is the urge and the hunger to reach out for someone else's benefit. Love, edification, building up someone else, that is the issue. And love is to be the basic biblical reason for prophesying or for any spiritual gift. Jesus came to earth not in anger or in destruction, but he came in love and he came in peace to speak into our depravity, into our chaos. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were dead, he came and did something about it. How about our lives? Are we just continuing on with the run? Are we con con cursing with our confession over people that we come into contact with? People that we see lost, oh, they're just going to stay drunks. They're so far gone. There's no hope for them. Are we continuing on with our words of death over an area? Are we doing what Jesus did for us, because that's what God has called us to. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He sent his son because he loved us. He was the word that came in the form of flesh. He was a love letter that was sent to mankind. And God calls us to be that love letter to be sent out into the world so that we can speak life and speak healing and speak restoration where there is death and chaos because he did it for us and he's given us his spirit which gives us the ability to be able to do it wherever we come into contact with. Prophesying is an act of love. It's not just saying some scriptures, but it's speaking love. It's coming into contact just like Ezekiel did when the spirit brought him out something that was interesting just through studying is in that 14 verses, 10, 10 words, 10 words are mentioned that all are a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It comes from the same uh, Hebrew word, which is ruach, the spirit, the breath, the wind of God. 10 times it's spoken in this scripture. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to, to take place and to come into our hearts so that we can truly breathe life into people, speak life, to be able to be that wind, to blow away the chaff in their life and to speak it into the atmosphere. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to come upon us? By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God to fit to equip, to mend, repair, to complete, and to make one what he ought to be. Prophesying is speaking God's truth over an area of your life or over someone you come into contact with. Are we able to get God's perspective in a matter to be able to see the original intent for which they were created for? And then being able to speak that over them. It only comes by coming into contact, by coming into agreement, by coming into unity. Acts 2, we see 120 believers in the upper room. 
So they were in unity and in one accord. And all of a sudden, a mighty rushing wind sweeps through. And what's, what takes place? There was tongues of fire that were upon them, and they started to speak in tongues. That God changed the way that they were speaking. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to change the way we speak? To be able to speak life, to speak encouragement, to speak healing, to speak restoration into those around us? Are we coming into contact to be able to do that? Let's just close right now. You guys come up. As we go into this song, I really want us to to be mindful, to be receptive and to hear from the Holy Spirit, what is he to say? What does he want to say in my life? What are the areas maybe, maybe I'm doing a good job in speaking in certain areas, but maybe there's still one area in my life that, that, that is speaking falsehoods, it's speaking negativity, it's speaking disunity and discord, it's speaking destruction. Jesus said that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to bring life and life more abundantly. Who are you allowing to speak through you? Are there words of death and destruction coming out of your mouth? Or are there words of life and healing? And I really want us to be able to create an atmosphere to hear from the Holy Spirit. And maybe you won't speak right now, but maybe it might come later on today or even in this week. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak to us clearly and concisely the areas where our mouth needs to be changed. We thank you for showing us that our lives are lived in valleys. Very rare do we be able to have those mountaintop experiences, but most of our life is lived in the valley. So I pray God that you would show us areas of our life that we need to watch how we speak so that we can be victorious, so that we can be overcomers, that we can be prosperous, that we can be successful. And that will continue to lead us down the path of the design that you created us for, Lord. The very